what does self-love really look like? You are actually deserving and worthy, but you don't realize it. I am actually a beautiful product of the universe, a child of the universe, as we all are. It's not our thoughts that create our reality. It's really what we feel about ourselves. It's about how much we love ourselves. When you're living a life that is not from self-love, you're living a life trying to meet other people's expectations. And that sets you up to fail. Hi hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever thought we've got things flip-flopped backwards and upside down on earth, then do we have the Heaven on Earth show for you. Today I'll be talking with Anita Morjani, the New York Times best-selling author of Dying to Be Me, and a guest I've been looking forward to speaking with for as long as we've had this show. She's now the author of a beautiful new book with a fantastic orange rose on the cover, What If This Is Heaven? And that's what I want to talk with her about today, how our cultural myths prevent us from experiencing heaven on earth and unconditional love. That plus we'll talk about chocolates and desserts, perfume and handbags, cities versus seasides, skirts and synchronicities, the significance of orange roses, and what in the world Battlestar Galactica has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Anita. Are you ready to shine? Absolutely. And oh, gosh, I love your introduction. I love it. <laughs> I've never had one like that before. So thank you for being unique. Well, thank you. And then a mighty woohoo <laughs> for having yep. you on the show. So before we dive right into things, I think we have to start. We have to start at the I don't know if the end is the right point. Can you tell us about the orange roses you received just as you were finishing the final chapters of this book? Yeah, that was really interesting. So um, I had just completed a tour with Wayne Dyer and I'd been touring with him for four years and we'd just done a tour of Australia and I had just arrived back home in Los Angeles and um, we, we were hosting some friends for lunch uh, and one of my friends, she's, she's, a little, she's pretty um, tapped in, psychic, Mm -hmm. So she walks into my apartment with a huge bouquet of beautiful orange roses and they were stunning. And I said, wow, thank you, Jennifer. And she goes, what's with the orange? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I was reaching for the red roses, but there was this male voice that I could hear in my head that kept saying, get her the orange ones, get her the orange ones. And she says, it was a really strong male voice. You've obviously got a man on the other side who's looking out for you and who wanted me to get you the orange roses. And I thought, really? Now, that had never happened to, be, uh, happened to me before, not specifically like that, mm -hmm. not a male voice, not somebody saying anything like that. So I was thinking, I wonder who that could be. It doesn't sound like it was my dad or anyone who's happens to be on the other side. Um, and I started to think, gosh, I hope somebody close to me hasn't passed away and hasn't crossed over and I don't realize it yet. So anyway, after a little while, I kind of dismissed it and we got into having our lunch and we were laughing and we were talking. And then my phone rings, my cell phone rings. And I saw the caller ID was Wayne Dyer's manager and assistant who'd been traveling with him. And she was really close to me because she was always there on all our tours. And so I pick up the phone and I go, hey, Maya, what's going on? And I hear on the other end, she's crying. And she goes, it's Wayne. He's gone. He went in his sleep this morning. And wow, I was just, you know, my heart just sank in that moment. And in that moment, I was just in too much shock and grief to put two and two together. But, but much later that day, I realized, oh, it was Wayne. He was the one telling Jennifer, get her the orange roses. And you know, even now, as I tell you the story, I just feel the goosebumps through my body because I'm just remembering that day. And Wayne knew that orange was my fame, favorite color. He knew it was my favorite color and he would tease me about it because everything of mine was orange, my wallet, my phone case, my handbag, and everything was orange. And 
he would always have an orange on stage with him because he would always give this analogy about when you squeeze an orange, what comes out? Orange juice. So when you squeeze a person, in other words, when you stress out a person or when you insult a person, what comes out is what's inside. Um, so it's not about the person who's doing the squeezing. It's about what's inside of you. And then he would give that analogy and then he would always, and he says it more elegantly than I just did, but then he would always throw his orange out into the audience mm -hmm. for somebody to catch. And the very last post on his Facebook page before he died was a picture of an orange with that analogy. And so when I, so I was on my Facebook and I saw that and then I thought, oh, it was Wayne. It suddenly reminded me of everything that his penchant for oranges, my penchant for the color orange, his teasing me constantly about orange. And I thought, that was Wayne. She specifically said it was a very strong male voice. And so I felt, wow, he was trying to tell me he's, he's okay and he's still looking out for me. Awesome, awesome, and serious goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. So going from there, and you were kind of finishing up your book at that point, what motivated you to write this book? Because it sounds like there was still, well, there's still a lot of energy from your last book. Yeah. So now there's a bunch of things. There, there's two aspects to the motivation to write this book. When I wrote my first book, I thought that I've given my story. What more is there to write? But after writing the first book, I received so many, so many letters from people who they loved my book, but they were sharing their pain. They were sharing their grief, their fears, their illnesses. And I realized the world is in so much pain. And it started to weigh me down because, um, because they wanted to apply what I was saying to mm -hmm. their lives. And that's when I started to realize that I needed to write more. They want to know more. So I needed to write more. So that's what inspired the writing of the book. But I'll tell you what inspired the title of the book. So even as I was writing the book, I was constantly on this self-discovery of always realizing the truth that all I have to do is be who I am, shine my light brightly. I can't help anyone else if I allow myself to get dragged down into the pain and the fear. I have to be, I have to light, you know, keep my own bulb lit up so that at least um, others can see where it's dark. You know, it doesn't help anyone if I sink back down into the fear-based person I used to be before. So... I started to realize, I looked back on my life when I was coming up with a title. I looked back on my life over the last 10 years and I thought, you know, my life before, before the NDE was one filled with fear. It was one filled with illness and it was a fear of everything. It was one where I grew up being bullied. It was one where my life was hell. It was basically, I would call it a living hell. But after the NDE, I have felt this extreme clarity of how I need to live my life. I have felt fearless. I have, like the fear is gone. And to me, one huge difference between heaven and hell is, is fear, whether you're living from a place of fear or a place of joy. I felt that I had come out of a history of living in a place of reaction mm -hmm. and I'd moved into a place of creation. And so I realized also that, um, you know, that when I'd come out of the NDE, I could not go back to being that person I used to be. And I could not live in this world where everything stems, uh, where, where we're driven, everything is driven from a place of fear. Our religions are driven from fear. Our governments use fear. Our medical system and the way we understand health is totally done by fear of illness. Our education system is driven by a fear of failing. I could not buy into that reality anymore. So I have lived the last 10 years from a place of creation, from a place of choosing from my joy rather than being driven by, by fear. And I looked back and I thought, wow, you know, everything has happened in just the most synchronicitous and beautiful way because I've been living my truth and living what I'd learned. And 
I've never had to worry about my health. Mm -hmm. I felt free and light and, and not filled with fear. And I felt liberated. I felt, I felt amazing. I loved what I did every day. I got to do stuff that I wanted to do. I'm able to travel. I've never had to worry about finances. And I started to think to myself, wait a minute, that sounds like being in heaven. And I started to think, <laughs> yeah. And I started to think maybe when I died, I didn't come back. Maybe I thought I did, mm -hmm. but my life is so different since coming back that maybe actually I'm still there. I'm in heaven, and this is what it means to live in heaven. And hence the book title, What If This Is Heaven? What if I am still there? <laughs> Amazing. Do you, and, and I have, we, we discussed off air briefly, I had my first of two NDEs uh, April 2nd, 2006, a couple months after your first or, or after yours. Um, so I have a little bias in this question here. Has it felt at times like you're surfing waves, like you're able to hold, uh, be on the wave, remember who you are, remember where you came from, and then you go down the wave and that fear starts to creep in and you have to wait to catch it or get back up on top of that wave again? Yes, yes, it does. It does feel like that. And and the thing is, but there's a knowing mm -hmm. that, okay, there is going to be another wave coming and I'm going to surf it and, and, I, and I can do it and I can ride it and I can ride the next wave. And yes, the wave will go down and then a few old feelings will creep up. But what happens with every wave, you can ride a a bigger and higher wave. You You become more experienced at riding the waves. What but however, people who um, have been conditioned by fear, they feel fearful even getting on that wave. They feel fearful even riding that wave, so much so that they stay um, on the sidelines. They stay in that, in that non-wave, you know, the down part, and they stay there a lot longer than they need to. They don't know how to get on that wave. And, and this is the problem. It's like our, the way we've been conditioned um, teaches us to stay in that fear-based place. It doesn't teach us. It's not our society, our culture, our world, the way we've created it, the way we believe, the way we think, the way we teach people is not conducive to them riding one wave and then watching out for the next one and riding the next one. It's more conducive to us fearing those waves and running away from the waves. Is, and I love that analogy, so thank you. Oh, thank you. It, it seems... It, it... Not only are people scared of riding the waves, but there's almost an amygdala, lizard-like brain response if you start to tell them how grand and majestic they truly are. Yeah. It becomes really scary for people to share that they're not a little person, that they're so much larger than that. Yeah. So let's go from here, maybe, and we'll let's let's dive into some of these beautiful myths, and and we'll start with myth number one, which is you get what you deserve, and maybe you can take us back. I was I was sharing before, I was the the good Jewish boy in Catholic school. That didn't go so well. <laughs> can you tell us what happened when you were eight in grade school? Yeah, I was the little Hindu girl in Catholic school. Oh, no. And, um, and I was one of very, very, very few people who was not, um, you know, British, not white skinned. And so I, I was picked on. I was bullied. I was picked on very, very badly, very badly. And, uh, I had dark, curly hair, wavy, thick, wavy hair. Um, and just, yeah, just, just different looking, you know, I had thicker eyebrows and everything. So, so I looked different and I, my, my life, my personal life was different because I didn't go to church on the weekends. Mm -hmm. I didn't pray to the same God. <laughs> my parents went to temple, went to the temple. And so it was very different and I got picked on. I got bullied. And one of the things at that time when I was growing up was that, um, I mean, I went to a British school, but people of my culture were, uh, and this was not the case for me. My parents were 
um, were my father had left India and, and gone abroad and set up a business and he was very successful and he did this to give his children a better life and to put them through a westernized education system. But at that time when I was growing up, people of my culture worked in very lowly jobs for Western people. And so basically, um, people of my culture were um, housekeepers, they were doormen, they were the, the, they had the lowly jobs and they worked for Western people who ran the companies in the city where I lived, which was Hong Kong, which at that time was a British colony where the highest jobs were held by um, basically Western, white Western people. And so I was constantly feeling like I had to prove that I was worthy of their attention because I was not a servant, basically, and did not, and my parents were not servants. Not that there's anything wrong in being one, but, um, but there was this sort of huge disparity, yes. And coupled with the fact that even within my own culture, my mm. own Indian culture, women are second class citizens to men. So there was the gender disparity even within my culture. And then there was the race disparity outside of my own race and culture. It seems like it would put you, you had like at least three strikes, maybe more than that against you, because you then couldn't ask for help within your school and you couldn't even... Um, as a female in your culture, ask for help outside of your school either. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot that was expected of me. And as I grew, as I grew into my teens, late teens, in my culture, and especially at that time, but I know, no, it still happens, I'm saying at that time, uh, but it still happens very much so. Arranged marriage is the norm. And so parents bring up daughters to prepare them for an arranged marriage. So... I wanted to, you know, because I wanted to um, study. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to have a career. I wanted to travel the world. But all of those things make you less desirable as a wife. And so my parents wouldn't let me do any of those things because they said I would have problems later because um, I wouldn't be able to find a good husband. So, and it seems like the problems that were supposed to be later came sooner. Maybe we go into this myth and then what happened to you because of how you internalized all of this? So because I internalized all of this, I truly, truly believe that that's one of the huge reasons why I got cancer, because I spent a lifetime of feeling that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not deserving. I constantly have to work really hard at proving myself to other people. Um, and it was, of course, you know, bullying is, also, is in itself a form of abuse, like childhood abuse. So it totally impacted my self-esteem and how I carried myself in the world. And I truly believe that the cancer was a manifestation of all these emotions turning inwards against me. So, oh, and I want to talk about how how you ended up. Uh, we'll get to unconditional love very shortly because that's a that's a that's a hot topic of mine. But the myth is you get what you deserve. So, if that's a myth, what is the opposite of that, or what is it really? The opposite is that you are actually deserving and worthy, but you don't realize it. And because we're told that, like, because I was conditioned to believe that, um, you know, that it's my karma. And then later on in life, when I started to believe in things like the law of attraction, I believed I had attracted it with my thoughts. And in my NDE state, I realized none of that is true. I am actually a beautiful product of the universe, a child of the universe, as we all are. You are, I am, everybody tuned in is, everybody is. But the problem is that we don't realize it. We don't know that we are. And that's what the problem is. So it's not that there's something wrong with us. It's not that we're not deserving and worthy. It's that we all are. But the problem is that we don't know it. It's been conditioned out of us. Thank you for sharing that. And in particular, mentioning the law of attraction, because a lot of people get flipped upside down and backwards and go grab a mirror and say, 
well, self, you created this. <laughs> I, I have a lot to say about that, but yes. <laughs> well, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So what happens is that when we believe really strongly that our thoughts create our reality. And I truly believed that when I had the cancer. And so what happens is that we start to fear our thoughts, which is what I was doing. I feared my thoughts and I tried to control my thoughts. And I also felt I had always been a positive person because I wanted everybody to like me because I was a people pleaser. I had always been a positive person because I was afraid of anyone saying I was negative and, and I was constantly positive. So I couldn't understand how did I, such a positive person, get cancer if our thoughts create our reality? It was only when I died did I realize it's not our thoughts that create our reality. It's really what we feel about ourselves. It's about how much we love ourselves. It's about how much we know how worthy and deserving we are. And when you truly love yourself, when you know how worthy and deserving you are, even if you're having a negative thought, you don't judge it. You don't judge yourself harshly. And that's the most important thing is to truly accept who you are. All of you, every part of you, accept it. Even the negative thoughts. Because as soon as you accept this is a part of who you are, those negative thoughts, they pass. But if you fear them, you're actually feeding them. The other thing is when you deny your negative thoughts, you're denying an aspect of yourself and you're denying yourself from having an authentic experience. And you, what you are actually saying is there is a part of myself that's wrong and I deny it and I have to suppress it. Whereas what I'm inviting you to do is to love all of you, accept all of you, even the parts of you that you believe are broken. And that's another thing. I don't believe anybody is broken. I just think one of the problems is that we think we are. And so there are, you know, um, there are some blocks between us recognizing that we're not broken. But I don't like working on the premise that you're broken, you need to be fixed. My premise is that you were born perfect. You were truly born perfect. Um, but somewhere along the way, you forgot. You lost your way. So let's help you to remember. But you're not broken. So let's, let's take a few of these elements. We're just going to see where we go today. So first off, you gave a talk. You've given many beautiful, beautiful talks. And you share about this one later chapter. It might have been chapter eight or so, where there is a woman whose child had passed away. And yeah. she was there. And you didn't try to say, I'm so proud of you for how you handled this. You didn't try to say, oh, it's all perfect. It's all blah, blah, blah. You simply acknowledged how she was feeling. Yeah. And to me, um, I think that just meeting someone where they are and giving them the space to feel what they're feeling, to me, that is unconditional love. That is unconditional love. But I really felt that um, in that moment, if I started to offer her platitudes of how she should handle it and how she should feel, I, I just felt that I would not be honoring who she is and where she is right now. And for her to love and honor herself, I had to show her that I honored and loved her exactly where she is. And she didn't have to change for me. And who am I to tell her how to react in that situation? I haven't walked in her shoes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to love her. But yeah, and, and in that chapter, I talk about how I received criticism for reacting that way. Which was probably the most perfect way that you could have reacted. Yeah. From there, let's, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned that we are born perfect just as we are and it's interesting when you say that because i can hear people listening how i can hear my own inner voice going yeah and, until i screw things up <laughs> <laughs> but there there is no sin there is no judgment is there even any screwing things up it's part of the journey and i see it all as checks and balances so you know because we are so afraid of being judged we're so afraid of shame 
And so when we, what we consider screwing something up, it's because we're afraid somebody's going to judge us and we're afraid of the consequences. But in actuality, there is no such thing as screwing things up because when you, when you say you screwed something up, you screwed it up by whose judgment, by whose standard. And so the minute we remove the judgment, you know, because we feel we screwed something up when we're put in a position where we're like, oh my gosh, I got to admit that I made this mistake and I went this wrong direction and I screwed up and I let people down. But what if we just change that a bit and say, oh my gosh, um, I just learned this huge lesson that doing it this way really doesn't work. And so let me just tell everybody, I'm really sorry I took you down this path, but we remove the whole I, judgment. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm articulating this properly, but I believe that when we are so afraid of screwing up, all it does is it makes us hide a part of who we are. Um, it makes us hide from it. It makes us hide it from ourselves, believing that we're going to hide it from the rest of the world as well. That makes sense. That fear of screwing up, it's fascinating because if we came here to learn, how do you learn anything by getting it right the first time? Exactly, exactly. Because if you learn by, by your mistakes, um, I mean, that is truly the only way to learn. I mean, if I could tell you how many, I can't even tell you how many mistakes I've made navigating through life these last 10 years since my near-death experience, because I didn't, um, I mean, the world is not conducive to the way I view life now. It's just not conducive. There is nowhere I can turn to and say to somebody, okay, teach me the rules now, the way I look at life. Because I don't look at illness the way I used to. Mm -hmm. I don't look at... Um, I don't look at everything the government says the way I used to. I don't look at religion the way I used to. So if I can't turn to the way conventional medicine is, I can't turn to religions. I can't turn to what we've been indoctrinated in our cultures. I can't turn to all those normal things. Where can I turn to? There is no um, set of rules or, or anything for me to follow. So I've had to figure it out myself. I've had to navigate it myself. So I have fallen down on my face probably every single day trying to figure it out. But there's only one thing, one thing that I stick to that keeps me going. And that one thing that stays in my head is be authentic, be authentic, be authentic. So even when I fall down flat on my face, and screw things up really bad, I tell everyone around me, hey, I don't know how to do this. I really don't know how to do this. I got this wrong. And so I'm just really honest about it. And that's, uh, and that's how I believe that, that life should be. And then we kind of share from a place of authenticity. Beautiful. And I imagine you bring a little bit of, uh, of laughter, if not the occasional tissue with you as well. <laughs> Yeah, lots of tissues. <laughs> so from there, let's talk about myth number two, which is loving yourself is selfish. Maybe you can tell us about your friend Irene. All right. So this is um, very common where, um, number one, it's common for people to think that loving themselves is selfish. But even the people who, who know that loving yourself is okay, it's also common for them to think that just because they allow themselves to have um, massages, go to the spa, wear great clothes, have makeovers, you know, buy the handbags, buy the shoes. They believe that doing all those things for themselves means they're loving themselves. And a lot of people also believe that um, that their children, you know, people say young people these days, they really selfish, they really love themselves. They're engrossed in their own world and all they want to do is buy stuff. Now, um, I believe that all those things are the opposite of loving yourself. These are things we do to compensate. So in my conversation with Irene in chapter two, Irene is challenging me on two things. One is she's saying loving ourselves is selfish. And I'm explaining to her that I see that 
as a sign of com compensating for the lack of love they have for themselves and the lack of love they're getting from the world. But also, in addition, I believe that because as parents, you know, my generation of people have not learned to love ourselves. So how do we love, how do we teach our children to love themselves if we ourselves have not learned to love ourselves? So we ju we're just perpetuating it even by believing that I have to sacrifice myself for my children, even by believing that, even by believing I'm being selfless by, by putting my children first and putting myself last, we believe that we're doing the right thing for our children. But what you're actually doing is you're perpetuating the myth with your children that they then need to do that as they move forward. Because children learn by who you are not just by what they read or what you tell them to read. Which is why you have got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first yes. before you take care of your kids. Exactly. Because they're exactly. watching. They're sponges. And I was just going to say that they, they literally, they absorb your energy from the time they're born. They absorb, you know, your, um, your mental, emotional feelings because people tell me, all the time that their babies know when the parents are upset about something or when the parents are going through trauma. Little children who can't even speak yet, they know, they feel it, they react to it. So it's so important that you empower yourself, you find your own joy, you do these things for yourself because your children entrain themselves to your energy. What does self-love, if we know what isn't self-love, it's not the massages, it's not, it's not giving yourself X, Y, or Z, what does self-love really look like? Okay, so um, just to clarify about it not being the massages uh, and things like that, so before I go into what self-love looks like, if you love yourself, it's totally fine to have the massage and do yeah. your hair and all that. Yes, it's totally fine. And I do those things. I love it. There's nothing wrong with it. What I was saying is, but people who do those things, it doesn't mean they love themselves. Because in many ways, people who go for makeovers and who um, buy stuff for themselves, they could be doing, from a, doing it from a place of fear of um, fear of wanting to keep up with a particular look or a particular peer group or following what the advertisers tell them they should look like. So that is doing things out of fear. Doing things from a place of love. So what self-love looks like. Self-love means, it. first of all, it does not mean um, being she, narcissistic, um, putting you know, putting down others. It means none of those things. It means checking in with yourself and asking yourself questions like, all these things that I'm doing, do they bring me joy or am I doing them out of a fear of the consequences of not doing them? And really evaluating the condition of your life and every single thing you're doing every day. Am I hanging with these people because I love being with them, because they revive me, or because I'm afraid if I'm not with them, um, they'll, they'll say stuff about me and I need to keep up with them. So every single thing you're doing, are you doing it out of fear or out, out of love? And also, it means being unafraid of making choices because they bring you joy, not because they have any other deeper meaning or purpose or consequence or, uh, or anything, but it's just, this brings me joy, so I'm going to do it. And this brings me, this, this is following my passion. Like when I choose a job or a career, am I choosing it because I'm afraid I won't have money if I don't go down this path? Am I choosing it because I'm afraid a better one won't come along? Or am I choosing it because this is my passion? This is what I want to do. So self-love is a life. What it looks like is, is a life where you're doing things where you're following your passion. You're following your joy. It doesn't mean everything goes right all the time. You will still have challenges. But when you're living a life that is not from self-love, you're living a life trying to meet other people's expectations. And that sets you up to fail. 
And when you fail, you're failing because the life you're living is not your life. You're trying to be something you're not. When you fail, but you're living a life of self-love where you're following your passion, when you feel a failing, that failing is to take you to the next level of who you are. It's to take you to the next level of your path of passion and joy. It doesn't leave you burnt out and feeling like you're going through a crisis because you're still living your life. You're not living a life of trying to be something you're not and to meet other people's expectations. Woohoo! <laughs> it's a term that came to mind. I'd never thought of it this way. Um, but while you were saying that, aligning yourself with your divine light. Yes, yes. I love that. And it is about aligning yourself with your divine light. It's who you came here to be. It was, it was, you know, your soul's longing even before you were born. And then we come here. And the reason we forget is because we hear everybody else's voices and our own soul's longing gets drowned in the voices of the external world. And this is why I tell people, turn inward, turn inward, turn the external noise down and turn the inner one up and listen to your own soul's longing and shine that light as brightly as you can. <laughs> to turn inward, is it, is it meditation? Is it mindfulness? Is it, as I like to describe it, the kitchen sink? <laughs> Yeah, I like that. I like the kitchen sink. And so, and over here, I tell people about turning inward. It is whatever feels good for you. So here's the thing. A lot of people talk about meditation, but if you are running around all day long, really stressed out, and then you're like, I have to do 20 minutes of meditation a day. And then you're really stressed to squeeze that 20 minutes of meditation in. And then if you miss it, you get even more stressed out. And then you have this 20 minutes or one hour where you lock the door, you lock out all sounds and all that. And then you have your meditation and then you beat yourself up for getting it wrong because you weren't able to keep all the thoughts out of your head and you're following this process. That is not turning inward. And so I don't really buy into just what, you know, like prefabbed, prepackaged, the prepackaged idea of meditation. There are many good guided meditations out there, many good ones, but it's not the meditation. It's not the idea of meditation. It is a state of being. It is a state of being. So that state of being has to be attained and then meditation is the result of that state of being. So, um, so it's not about trying to meditate. The minute you're trying to meditate, you're better off stopping. Just stop. There's no trying. Because when you are in that state of being, you are naturally meditating. So if I can articulate that further, what Please. I mean further, it can be the kitchen sink. It can be going for a walk in nature. It can be listening to music. It can be sitting in a bubble bath in, in the tub, soaking in the tub. It can be whatever works for you, whatever works for you. But it is, it has to be seen primarily as a slot of time that you give yourself to honor your soul, to honor your soul, not necessarily to honor your external self, not necessarily to go out shopping and buy those outfits, which is wonderful to, to do. I love buying new outfits as well. But you need to honor your soul. And the question to ask yourself is, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And that's all. That's the only question we need to ask ourselves. And then everything else we do stems from knowing or, or exploring the answer to that question. So whether it's a question of, okay, which job shall I take? What shall I do? What hobbies shall I do? The answer to all those questions is, who am I? And once you know who am I, then everything else stems from that. Everything else stems from the kind of job you would choose. Shouldn't be about which one pays more money, um, which one does this. It's, okay, which job reflects who I am? Who am I? Which job 
speaks to me, which job describes who I am. So it's all about who I am. And so the meditation is the same. The meditation is the journey to discovering who am I. That's what meditation is. Woohoo! <laughs> From there, let's let's talk about the third myth. Real love means anything goes. And and I want to talk about unconditional love and fireflies and the sun. <laughs> yes, so fireflies and the sun. So to me, um, love has to be unconditional. And we really need to have two different words, two different words, because the minute it becomes conditional, it's something else. And the analogy I use in my book is that the sun's love is unconditional. The sun's light is conditional. To me, love is light. And uh, the sun's light is unconditional. The sun doesn't decide who it's going to shine on. It is. It exists 365 days a year, every single day. Even if you can't see the sun, it's still there, shining its light on half the planet. And it's the, it's the planet that's turning. But the sun is unconditional. It just is. It never, ever, ever stops shining. To me, that is divine love. Maybe divine love is a better word than unconditional love. But that is divine love. It just never stops. It doesn't decide I'm not going to shine for the criminal who just shot someone. I'm not going to shine for that terrorist, but I am going to shine for this one who just fed the homeless person. It doesn't make such distinctions. There is no judgment. It shines equally for everybody. Whereas a firefly's light glows in the dark, but you can't always see it. Sometimes it's there and then sometimes you really have to focus in. And that's what earthly love feels like. When we're on earth and when we are living in this world where we turn on the news and there is so much fear being fed to us, we have to look for those fireflies. We have to look for the people, you know, like in a situation of terrorism. We then have to look for the people who are going in there to rescue people, who are, who are helping the ones who are hurt. And there we see the fireflies. There we see that love. And the whole scenario as a scene is not one of unconditional love because you have victims mm -hmm. and perpetrators, and then you have those who come in with their love and rescue those victims. And so we have to look for the fireflies in our life every day in physical life. Whereas when we die, it's like we've merged with the sun. We've merged with unconditional love. And that's that's all of us. That is even the perpetrator and the other people in the news and these horrific yes. stories. It's all yes. of us. We're all, we all are merged with the sun. We all get that same sun, which does not discriminate. So then let's go from there. Maybe we can do a little more rescuing for people today. When we say real love doesn't mean anything goes, what does it mean as far as relationships and maybe relationships that are challenged? And, and I'm really excited to hear about the uh, three non-negotiables that you have with Danny. Oh, right. Oh, gosh. I have to recollect the, the non-negotiables because I wrote them down. But I know the biggest one, the biggest non-negotiable is that we never, ever criticize each other. Never. We always honor each other. We never criticize each other, no matter what. Um, we discuss everything. We never go to bed angry. We never go to bed angry. And... Uh, and so those, those are two of the, like the real non-negotiables. We, and every morning we always hug each other and we say good morning. And every single day we say, I love you. And I'm trying to, re the reason I'm trying to recall the three non-negotiables I wrote in the book is because we actually have a lot more than three. And I had to narrow it down to three for the book. So, but we well, have, these are, so these many. are great. We'll take more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we make it a point to say, I love you every single day, every single day. We make it a point to hug every single day, every morning, every night, at least we give each other a hug and not criticizing each other is, is a big one. And we've not done it for the 21 years we've been married. And I want to also speak on what you have said about real love means anything goes, which is a myth. Um, a lot of people believe that in order to be 
unconditionally loving towards others, it means allowing others to treat them as they please. And a lot of people make that mistake, but I've noticed women, it seems to be more women that do that. And what happens also, a lot of people who are in this um, role or world of being spiritual teachers, mm -hmm. people who are being spiritual teachers, sometimes when we are attacked or we are uh, being abused, and then we take some steps to protect ourselves from that or defend ourselves from that, um, we are open to people saying to us, oh, you're not as unconditionally loving as you purport to be. So here's where I keep telling people, uh, you know, and people say, your message is to be unconditionally loving. And here's where I say, my message is to love yourself unconditionally. Love yourself mm. unconditionally. And when you love yourself unconditionally, you don't allow people to treat you as they please. You really don't. You teach people how you want to be treated. Loving yourself unconditionally does not mean allowing yourself to be abused by others. And having boundaries and standing up for yourself um, does not mean being unloving towards other people. It absolutely does not. And in fact, it's the most perfect thing to do, even for other people, because it teaches them how you want to be treated. It teaches them to reevaluate their behavior towards you because how will they learn that their behavior is unacceptable unless you show them that you can't be treated this way and you don't even have to do it in a, in a cruel way if that's not your style. I'm someone who's very non-confrontational, so I'm always finding gentle ways of, of expressing my boundaries and telling people, no, this is not who I am. This doesn't feel right to me. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't reflect who I am. And, and I'm constantly telling people that um, as long as our visions are aligned, mm -hmm. we can do this together. But as soon as it stops being aligned, whether for you or for me, we need to be authentic and honest with each other and be okay with parting ways. And so I, I make all these kinds of things pretty clear. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You actually, you have an expression near the end that's similar to mine near the end of the book. You say, and, and it's talking about the myth of inequality, and you're talking about gentle is strong. And I tell everybody, gentle is the new strong. <laughs> I like that. That is so true. Gentle so, is the new strong. It is. Let's go from there. Both you and I have a very different take. I was told uh, not only would I be lucky to survive, I'd be lucky if I ever kept my leg and ever walked again. I've run marathons since then. I'm a bunch of titanium parts, but I'm doing it and doing it well. So I think we have a very different take on health care and what that really means and looks like, particularly how we wrap our minds around it. So my um, belief is that, yes, absolutely, we do often need professionals to help us in areas where we have no knowledge. And I also want people to know that if you are suffering a serious illness, a debilitating illness, don't be afraid to ask for help from experts. Absolutely do not be afraid. But here's the thing. When it comes to healthcare, I truly believe that true healthcare has to make you feel empowered. It has to make you feel that you're being cared for, that you're being taken care of, that you are, that your power is not being stripped away from you. It has to alleviate or help to alleviate your fear. Because if you are constantly in a fear-based mode, then what's happening is your body is releasing all these hormones that are wearing you down and suppressing your immune system. Because, you know, being in fear, we should, it's a survival mechanism. And we need fear sometimes. Some fear is good. But we only need fear when our life is under threat, where we need to be able to outrun or outfight the threat, the physical threat. But what has happened is we have become a race or a culture that is constantly in fear. Every time we switch on the news, every time we have a test coming up, every time we're up for promotion, it's like 24-7, we're in fear. The stock market goes down, we're in fear. This is happening, we're in fear. We are in constant fear. 
And what this does is it suppresses our immune system. It actually deploys, like if you think of an army, you're deploying valuable resources where they are not needed. And this opens us up to become vulnerable to illnesses. And then we go into a doctor or a hospital and we have these tests. And when we get the results, we are put into even more fear. And this is where I truly believe that, you know, I know the people who work in healthcare, they mean well. They're beautiful people. They were, they, they really looked after me well, but they did make me feel fearful. I believe those people should help you to alleviate the fear so that you can release those resources from within your body to help you heal instead of those resources being used in that fight or flight mode. Beautiful. That's kind of where I am also with healthcare. You talk about internal, thank you. You talk about internal guidance system and and really listening on the inside. And you shared a beautiful example. We'll just touch on it, base on it briefly here. But what a powerful term, information fast. Oh, yes. So I I tell people that your own inner guidance system knows what's going on with you your own. And so we are constantly being bombarded. We are bombarded with information and it confuses us. Information from the internet, information from the doctors. When you're dealing with an illness or a challenge, you can get really confused as to how to deal with it. I ask people to go on an information fast, stop taking in information for 24 hours, 48 hours, and then use that time to silence your mind and ask yourself questions and see what comes up for you. And do not take information from outside, but pay attention to things that are just um, coming to your attention. Like it might just be something you notice or something that someone says and pay attention to the feelings that are arising in you. So um, for example, if you are afraid of certain treatments, you start, what you can do is start to think about those treatments and see the feeling that arouses within your body. Instead of researching that treatment more, if you ask yourself, how does it feel to go with this particular oncologist who has this particular protocol? How does it feel? And ask yourself, does it feel empowering? Does it feel like, yes, I trust this person, him or her. I trust them. I like what they're proposing and it makes me feel empowered. Then go with them and get people on your side. Get a team on your side who will support your choice and not people who will say, oh, you should have done it the other way. Um, because when I was going through this, whichever way I chose, I had people saying, that, oh, how could you do this? Like if I went with chemotherapy, they would say, how could you put all those toxins in your body? If I went the other way with alternative, people would say, oh my gosh, how could you go against what your oncologist is telling you? So now I tell people that tune in to your body and the idea is to feel empowered. It is to feel empowered because that is a huge part of your healing journey, the empowerment. And you want to go with a regime or a combination. You could do a combination of alternative as well as um, conventional. You could do even a uh, combination together with the Reiki or with faith, whatever. Just build together a regime that empowers you. And it has to be very personal. And you can only do this when you go on an information fast where you stop taking information from the outside and you start putting together what feels empowering for you through this healing journey. Woohoo! <laughs> from there, let's talk real briefly about egos because this is one that flips people upside down and backwards. The myth being spiritual people, oh, we're above having an ego. <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, I believe every single one of us has an ego, every single one, um, you know, whether we're spiritual or not. I actually believe every single one of us is spiritual. Mm -hmm. It's just that we don't all realize it, Thank you know, you. and there I was. Yes, every single person is spiritual. And I spent a lifetime thinking I had to work harder at being more spiritual, only to realize when I died that we are spiritual. We just don't realize it. So, so with the ego, we're all born with full awareness and full egos. 
people that appear to be egotistical, it's because their awareness of their connection to everybody else is somehow, has somehow been turned down, maybe through conditioning, maybe through experiences in this world. So people who we say are egotistical, there's nothing wrong with having a huge ego. You need an ego to survive in this world of duality. The only time you don't have an ego is when you die and you have no longer have a physical body and you're in the world of non-duality. And if you plan to live in non-duality with no ego, if that was your purpose, you would not have chosen to come into this physical life. The, the fact that you even chose to come into a physical body as a physical being to have life experiences, you would have to have an ego. But the problem only comes in, not because of your ego, but because of lack of awareness of our connection to all our fellow brothers and sisters on this planet. It's only when you believe that only I matter, only I am God, only I am an expression of God, only I have to get my way, and I have to do it at all costs, uh, even if it means tripping up everyone around me, that's when there's a problem. So when somebody believes that way, what we have to do is not say, turn down your ego, we have to say, turn up your awareness. We have to help them, teach them, or their life experiences will do that, will help them to turn up their awareness of everyone around them. And I truly believe that, in fact, the way our education system is right now, it's not conducive to fostering young children's awareness of other people who are different from them, it's of the world around them. It's competitive. And competitive competition brings out your ego collaboration brings out your awareness. And in my book, I give actual examples of how we can change this. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So can you tell us, Jessica likes me, to, she's my wife, she's also the producer, and, and my guiding light for that matter. She always li likes me to ask a question about parents and kids. And I'm wondering, with what you've just been sharing with us, what advice would you give to parents for guiding children and teens? I would tell parents, as parents, you don't have to worry too much about their, you know, their academic abilities. You don't push them to constantly get A's, don't push them to do their homework. I would spend a lot more focus in teaching them to become aware of the world at large and to know that there is a world out there, there is more than just the country or the city that you live in, and teach them to actually feel for people who are different from them. You want them to even try, for example, you could even tell them, how about we try an experiment? How about you pretend that you've lost the use of your legs and you pretend you can't walk? Let's try it for 24 hours. Let's maybe extend that to 48 hours. You can't walk, you're reliant on a wheelchair. So how do you go to the bathroom? How do you get up and down stairs? Isn't it, you know, like, and, and so you kind of start to get kids feeling it and thinking that way. And when they do that, when they try it for themselves, um, what will happen is they'll go out into the world, they'll be so aware of other people who are paraplegic, they'll immediately lend a hand. Or you can tell kids that, let's try going hungry and see what it feels like to not eat just because the food is there. Let's actually experience what hunger truly feels like and have kids experience feeling it or living off less money just as an experiment so that they can truly feel like what it is um, to be poor or to be hungry, to be homeless, all kinds of things you can teach kids. So then they truly become aware of the plight of the people around them. So when they see them, they empathize with them. It isn't just oh, I don't relate to that. There's an us and a them. There's an empathy that, oh gosh, I know what it feels like to be you. And if you do that to a whole generation of kids, just one generation, one generation of kids, 
you would have a different world when they grow up. They would think differently. They will create differently. They will make sure that nobody goes hungry. You would have a different world. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So on, on empathy, at the end of the day, as you go to sleep, you're ending your day, what is it you do for everyone on the planet? I send love to every single person on the planet, even the people who we have condemned and put in prisons, the people who are on death row. There's no us and them. They are as much us as we are. I mean, I know for a fact that I got cancer because I had turned my own energy inward against me. What if I had turned it outward and reacted very differently? And, you know, and it, it could have been a very different result. And maybe those people who are on death row, maybe it's the very same energy that I had turned in with, the, the fear, the lack of self-love, the believing that I'm unworthy. So I send them all love because if they knew what it was like to feel loved, to be loved, to love themselves, I don't think they would have done what they did. Woohoo! From there then, a question we like to ask just before the end, we'll have just a few wrap-up questions, maybe time for a smidge of meditation. What personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> oh my gosh, um, chocolate, woohoo! <laughs> that is a woohoo! <laughs> um, so many things, there's just so many things. I just, I love... Um, I love my husband just, I mean, he just makes me laugh. I love his sense of humor. I love meeting people who have just, who have read my books, who follow my work, who say, who tell me that what I'm doing is changing the way they think. And that gives me a big woohoo. And it, when doctors, medical doctors, when they tell me they've read my book and they share it with their patients, oh my God, that is huge for me. That is like really woohoo. Awesome, so. awesome, awesome. So on that note, a perfect segue. Where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful books? Oh, thank you. Well, I have a website, which is anitamorjani.com. Mm -hmm. I have a Facebook page. I also do a radio show at 12 noon Pacific every Wednesday, every Wednesday, 12 noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern. And uh, it's replayed a couple of times through the day. It's on Hay House Radio. So it's H-A-Y-H-O-U-S-E, hayhouseradio.com. My book can be purchased on Amazon or at my publisher's website, hayhouse.com. But it's at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and it's in all bookstores where new books are sold. So I uh, thank, you know, I mean, yes, thank you. Just I'm very proactive. Um, so please do write into my website, call into my radio show. I like to be very accessible, even though I cannot keep up with emails. But uh, I love to hear from you. I love to hear from everybody. Thank you. Fantastic. And if you're driving down the road, you didn't catch any or all of those links, just go on to over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll have all the links to get you over to Anita. Before I, before I let you go, and do you have time for a brief meditation at the end? I could do a quick meditation, a very short one. That'd be fantastic. Before that, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? I want you to know that you are perfect the way you are. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You're everything you are trying to attain. Don't take life seriously. Have fun. Laugh. Laugh at yourself. Dance to Dancing Queen and eat chocolate. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Anything All you right. feel called to share? Okay, so here's what I'd like to share. Uh, and only do this if you're not driving. I'd like you to close your eyes if you can, and I want you to imagine that you are on the last day of your life. And in fact, you're lying on your deathbed and you are about to take your final breath. And you are aware that with your next breath, you will have crossed over into the realm of death. This beautiful abyss waits you, and it is a beautiful, beautiful space, beautiful abyss. But 
at this moment, as you take that long last breath, you're looking back on the life you have lived. Now I want you to look back at this life you have lived. Look at all the things that you've done. And look at all the places you've been and the people who you have spent time with. Do you wish that there are things that you had done which you haven't done? What are they? Do you wish that there were people who you spent more time with who you didn't? Are there things that you spent time doing which you wished you hadn't spent as much time doing? Now I want you to ask yourself if you had it to do over again, what would you have done differently? What would you have done differently? And now I want you to slowly step into that abyss and open your eyes and realize you're being given a second chance to do it exactly as you want. Now go out and create the life you want. And that is a giant <laughs> Thank you so much, Anita. This was so special. This was so precious. The superlatives do not even begin to go there. I send you all the love in the world. Oh, I'm tearing up. Thank you. Thank you. I got to crank it back up for the finish. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun. Get What If This Is Heaven and experience heaven on earth and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you. You ask beautiful questions. Thank you. Wow isn't even a strong enough word. Love. There's the word that I'm looking for. Love, 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 love. Love for Anita Morjani. A love for you guys. What a beautiful, inspiring, oh my God, amazing interview with Anita Morjani. On that note, if you want to be able to connect with the other side, if you want to be able to connect with your angels, with your guides, with the love that is all there is and is you as well, and turn your journaling into channeling, then you want to pick up awe, oh, the automatic writing experience, the simplest, easiest tool to begin connecting with the other side today for guidance for love for words of wisdom for finding greater peace and harmony certainly and understanding in these challenging times you can get on of course at amazon or your local bookseller you can get it at automaticwriting.com where you can also get an entire video based program and live classes how does it get any better than this? That's automaticwriting.com. And if you want to become even a little bit more like the pure love that is Anita Morjani, the pure love that is you, then you want to come to our School of Mystics. We hold it four Wednesdays a month. You can find out about it and how you can become a mystic in training, a MIT, a mystic in training. You can find out about it at inspirenationuniversity.com and if you're enjoying this show and you want to get lots of behind-the-scenes goodness, click on the Join button and become a member of our inner circle. Lots of behind-the-scenes videos, inspiration, goodness, sneak peeks, and much more. On that note, I've got live YouTube events every Sunday night. To get ready for those events, click the subscribe button and the bell icon, which will notify you with upcoming shows, YouTube live premieres, and especially those events every Sunday night night. Here's a link to our next interview. Somewhere here is a link to our next interview. Big thumbs up if you like this. Leave your comments below. Love you guys so, so much. Shine bright. Woohoo!